Premanandi. <laughs> Is that image of Lord Chaitanya going to stay there or he's going to dance off the picture? He'll go, okay. <laughs> okay. Session 10 with three more to go after this. We're almost done. We're getting there anyway. So, this morning, we made a review of verse 37 and 38. 37 is that verse that is describing Shingara Rasa, specifically the relationship of Radha and Krishna and that rasa and how that rasa unfolds it, it becomes stimulated by the udipans by the various features of radha's 64 excellences and we discussed many things about that chapter details the following verse in order to with the eyes tinged with the sav of love of God, Premanjana, one can see Krishna in the higher stages of bhakti, 
not just um, believe him or believe in him, but actually see him. Not with these eyes, but with the eyes tinged or smeared with the salve of love. And then we began another section of verses indi indicated here. Govinda is the Lord of all lords. We mentioned that this section, 10 verses, is expanding one line of the first verse. Ishvara Parama Krishna. He is the Parama amongst all the Ishwaras. He's the supreme Ishwara. He's the Lord of all lords. So we discussed the, the realms, first of all, the Dham, Devidam, Maheshdam, Haridam, and Golokadam, their relative positions. And then starting with Devidam, the, the goddess of Devidam, Durga, we heard about her, and how she is receiving the powers for Shristi, Stiti, and Pralaya, for creation, maintenance, and destruction, from the order of Govinda, ultimately. And then we heard about Lord Shambhu and his very interesting uh, position, not easy to understand position, but at the same time um, appreciating as his consort Durga or Parvati, Shambhu or Lord Shiva or Mahesh receives the power to do what he does from the same Govinda. And so now we're going to be covering the next three this evening, 46, 47, 48. And tomorrow morning we'll cover the final four of this section. And then we'll have just a few verses left. We'll have four verses left for the rest of Sunday. So, 46, the presiding deities of Haridam. Note, it's Devidam, Maheshdam, Haridam. And specifically in this Haridam section, text 47, aside from the broad picture, it's Bhakti Siddhanta says this verse, this verse is specifically focusing on Shiradakshai Vishnu, the Paramatma, the Lord in the heart and within every atom of creation. But his abode is also in this Haridam region. Just like we know from Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says that place which after this universe is annihilated, that place remains. The, the abode of Shiradakshai Vishnu is within this universe and when the universe is withdrawn that planet remains because it's as we discussed we're in the spiritual sky but we're only seeing the cloud with, of material energy within the spiritual sky and the abode of Shiradakshai Vishnu is also in the spiritual sky but it's not with destroyed, because it's eternal. So, that's text 46. And then, very interesting topic about Anantashesh, um, and his role, his function, his service. And then following that is Mahavishnu, even specifically the breath of Mahavishnu. And how each of these three as well as the rest of the section. They're deriving their power to do what they do from Govinda. That's the Brahma Samhita's message. So, there's a little feedback with that sound. Let's go to um, chant the verse. You ready with the sound? Deva <laughs> <laughs> 
Vishnu Vishnu Dara Dimati Govinda Vani Purusha The first word, Deepa, Deepa Archi, the, the flame of a lamp. So that's Govinda. He's the original flame of the lamp from which other lamps become lit. Here's the translation. Hopefully. Help. There we go. The light of one candle being communicated to other candles, although it burns separately in them, is the same in quality. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, who exhibits himself equally in the same mobile manner in his various manifestations. So, the images here are um, in the left hand side Mahavishnu and then the upper right is Garbhadakshay Vishnu and the lower right is Shiradakshay Vishnu these three Vishnu forms they're called the Purusha avatars if you remember one of the verses back there was the discussion of Govinda is the source of all forms that, of avatars that descend within this world and one of the categories of avatars is this one, Purusha avatars. Govinda is the source of them and they are interested in assisting him, in fact specifically the Purusha avatars are, um, are manifest for the purpose of creation. This is one of the functions of the Supreme Lord. So, um, nice image, there's one candle in the palm of someone's hand and that one candle can then light another candle. And after you have the second candle lit from the first candle, <coughs> you hold them side by side, they both give off the same illumination and heat, light and heat are the same like one foot candle in 8th grade science <laughs> for each candle. And then you continue and from that candle other candles become lit and you get Diwali. <laughs> Deepa Vali a row of lamps and put them together and becomes Diwali. And in, in the same way the this verse of Brahma Samhita is indicating in the same way the various manifestations of the Supreme Lord, his Vishnu Tattva forms expand <coughs> from him. Each of them potency wise the same just like one candle and the next candle that's lit from the first candle. So when you walk into a room and, and Diwali day um, it the it's filled with lamps or the whole month of Dhamadarastakam or the Dhamadar month we offer lamps in the room because walk into the, the, the temple in Vrindavan the, the room is filled with lamps but there's one lamp from which all the other lamps were lit and that's the one that's on the altar they bring that lamp forward and Tupujari sits there and lights so many lamps but that, and that one lamp goes back on the altar. <laughs> and that one lamp that lights the other lamps, metaphorically, that's Govinda. Um, some further explanation to expand this, this understanding. Here's a quote from Adi Lila Chaitanya Charitamrita. Narayana and Krishna are the same. 
although we can speak of some differences between them, they're the same. Here's the verse. Narayana and Sri Krishna are the same personality of Godhead, but although they are identical, their bodily features are different. This personality of Godhead, Krishna, has two hands and holds a flute, whereas the other, Narayana, has four hands with conch wheel, mace, and lotus. And in the purport, Prabhupada writes, Narayana is identical to Sri Krishna. They are, in fact, the same person, manifest differently, like a high court judge who is differently situated in his office and at home. Same person, but there's his office, he's the high court judge. Yes, Your Honor. And at home it's Daddy, and Honey, and <laughs> intimate other kinds of expressions. Of um, so Krishna in his home, that's Krishna. And Krishna in the office, that's Narayana. Like that. Same person. Here we, we have a list taken directly from Nectar of Devotion or Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. Our regular devotees are familiar with this. The, the living entities, the jivas, us, have 50 of the total 64 quality of Krishna and to a small extent. Lord Shiva, Lord Brahma have another five plus a greater percentage or quantum of those 50. And then Narayana and Lord Vishnu, the Vishnu Tattva forms, they have an additional five. And here's that list of the additional five. He has inconceivable potency. We've been discussing that. He has uncountable universes generating from his body. Of course, that's Mahavishnu. He is the original source of all incarnations. He is the giver of salvation to the enemies whom he kills. And he is the attractor of liberated souls. So these five special features that are qualities of Narayana, not possessed. Lord, Lord Brahma doesn't create innumerable universes. He's not the source of all incarnations. He's not the giver of salvation, etc. Nor is Lord Shiva. But, so these are unique qualities to Lord Narayana and that Vishnu Tattva category. Um, here's Bhakti Siddhanta's description from the verse. In this shloka, the activities of the subjective portions feedback, okay. In this, in this shloka, the activities of the subjective portions of the divinity. Subjective portions means expansions. The activities of the subjective portions of the divinity, Govinda, are enunciated by the specification of the name, of the nature of Shiradakshai Vishnu. So that's what we're seeing over in the image on the, on the right. Vishnu indicates the all-pervading, omnipresent, and omniscient personality. So that super soul is everywhere. Paramatma is within the heart of every living entity, and then within every atom. So he's in that sense all-pervasive, uh, and omniscient, um, and omnipresent. Vishnu, the embodied form of sattva guna, is quite distinct from that of Shambhu, who is adulterated with mundane qualities. Again, this is Bhakti Siddhanta's language, but in the previous two verses ago, we discussed Lord Shambhu and the, the adulterating agents that, that 
make milk, be, as milk becomes curd or curdled in contact with acids, so that adultering agent of acid transforms milk into curd. Similarly, there's adulterating aspects that bring Lord Shiva into his own tattva, distinct from Vishnu. Whereas Vishnu is in this Vishuddha sattva position. And he concludes this little section, Vishnu is identical with Govinda as regards quality. And again, he goes on, though Vishnu is a divine appearance as a guna avatar, meaning he presides over the quality of goodness, the modes of nature, three modes in the material world. He presides over the mode of goodness, but he doesn't contact it. He doesn't become adulterated by it. He doesn't become, there's no material influence upon him. He maintains his purified, unadulterated status. Vishnu is Godhead himself, and the other two guna avatars and all other gods are entities possessing authority in subordination to him. So that should be clear. That, that's the previous section. He's the basis and support of all things. So it's a similar message is being presented here. In Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 2, Srimad Bhagavatam, there's uh, some discussion about the, the relative position of the modes of nature, where Lord Vishnu, amongst the deities, Lord Vishnu is um, best because he promotes the quality of goodness. The transcendental personality of Godhead is indirectly associated with the three modes of material nature, namely passion, goodness, and ignorance, and just for the material world's creation, maintenance, and destruction, he accepts three qualitative forms, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Of these three, all human beings can derive ultimate benefit from Vishnu, the form of the quality of goodness. This is now the Bhagavatam's language of explaining the relationship between Govinda, these three deities that preside over um, the modes. What happened? Was this showing on the screen? Yes? Just disappeared then showed again. Okay. Okay. So that's, it's a relationship. A sambandha or relationship um, message from the Bhagavatam. And then three verses later, the Bhagavatam says, somehow it says it, here it says it, whoop. Those who are serious about liberation, are you serious about liberation? Are certainly non envious. And they respect all. Yet, they reject the horrible and ghastly forms of the demigods and worship only the all blissful forms of Lord Vishnu and his plenary portions. So, while respecting all, worship goes to the Supreme. A similar message in, found in Bhagavad Gita. A, a devotee, we're trying to become devotees, Devotees are taught to respect every living entity. So respect is given proportionate to one's position. We respect an ant different than we may respect a king. And we may respect a king in a different way than we respect a demigod. But worship is for the personality of Godhead. Respect is for everyone. Worship is for the personality of Godhead. Um... That's that section. That was pretty quick. Wish they were all that quick, right? Here's um, 
if the there the, the Leela avatars are depicted here. So now we're going to chant together uh, the next sloka, text 47. And text 47 is about Anantashesh. So let us chant together. <laughs> I want to compliment these you enthusiastic kids in the front here. You're like really inspiring. <laughs> I think your chanting of the Govinda prayers is going to continue long after this seminar is over. I wouldn't be surprised if in your dreams you chant them. Because <laughs> it's with such enthusiasm. It's really nice. So, thank you. I want to, before we go to the translation, I want to highlight um, two important terms from the verse that's in the third line just above the Govindam refrain, Adhara Shaktim, Adhara Shaktim, and Sva Murtim. Adhara Shaktim, as you see in the word for word, is the all accommodating potency. The all accommodating potency. So this Adhara Shaktim has come up several times now in Brahma Samhita. It's coming up in verse 47, so we're going to do a little review of how it has come up, what does it mean, and how does it relate to Anantashesh, because he's the one that's being spoken of in this verse. And so Anantashesh is indicated by Sva Murtim, and I'd well, like to demonstrate that too, so these two terms. Here's the, the translation. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda. I hope I do. He doesn't want to do anything but adore Govinda. There we go. <laughs> Who, assuming his own great subjective form, Sva Murtim, subjective form. Who bears the name Shesha, replete with the all accommodating potency, Adara Shaktim, and reposing in the causal ocean with the infinity of the world in the pores of his hair, enjoys creative sleep. Yoga Nidra. So, there's Anantashesh, the couch or the resting place of Lord Vishnu. And here's a very nice painting. Many hoods on the Ananta Shesha with coils in such a way that although the ocean may be very turbulent, he has a nice comfortable place to rest. Mahavishnu. In the purport, it's just a one sentence purport, which reads Ananta, the same who is the infinite couch on which Mahavishnu reposes, is a distinctive appearance of the divinity bearing the name Shesha, having the 
subjective nature of the servant of Krishna. It's like, you know, the subject-object. The, he's the abode of love for the object of love. He's feeling love for Govinda. And that love comes in the form of, I want to serve you. So we have these two nomenclatures, Ananta and Shesha. Ananta means unlimited, and Shesha indicates paraphernalia, and you'll see why in just a moment. <coughs> so there's a very nice um, verse, amongst many nice verses, in Srimad Bhagavatam, where Jamuna, the, the river Jamuna personified, we see here in the painting, with folded palms coming before Balaram and offering him the, the prayer that you see, the circumstance, the Leela is, Krishna left Vrindavan. Now remember, in Goloka, Krishna never leaves Vrindavan. But in Gokula, there's a Leela. Krishna leaves Vrindavan. And the residents of Vrindavan are feeling intense separation from Krishna. Intense separation from Krishna. In fact, the only thing that's maintaining their life is that just before leaving, Krishna said, I promise I'll come back. I'll be gone for just a few days. Two to seven days I have to kill some demons. And then I'll be back. I promise. So, that promise of Krishna was maintaining their life. But more than two, than se two to seven days passed. Many days passed. Months passed. And Balaram, he had lived in Vrindavan. He knew the, ki knew the kind of love the residents of Vrindavan have for Krishna. He was in big anxiety for their safety and their well-being and you know when somebody that you love very much and you know so he, he went to Vrindavan to try to pacify them Krishna will come very soon I promise I'll, I'll, I'll get him to come he kept giving them his assurances and amongst those feeling the greatest separation from Krishna was the gopis so with a different set of gopis than the gopis who Krishna had rasa dance with, Balaram had his rasa dance. And um, when he had his rasa dance, it, it got a little wild. <laughs> he was drinking this honey-like beverage called Varuni. And he was getting a little tipsy from his dancing and the Varuni beverage. And he then called the river Jamuna, please come here so I can bathe. She thought, this person, I don't know if I want I don't know if I want to come near him. So she didn't. So with his plow, Balaram started pulling the river Jamuna to come to where he told her to come. And then she realized, uh-oh, this is Balaram. I'm messing with Balaram. And so she came out of the water with her palms folded, as you see, and offered this prayer. Rama, Rama, as in Balarama. Oh, mighty armed one, I know nothing of your prowess with a single portion of yourself you hold up the earth O Lord of the universe so what's that a single portion of yourself well the commentary explains um, that the phrase a kangshena or the single portion that indicates the Lord's expansion as Shesha. So what does Shesha do? He has many hoods and on his one, one form of Shesha holds up the planets. He's at the bottom of each universe and the planets are resting on his hoods. And then there's another form 
that's at the bottom of the Garbadak Ocean, excuse me, the, the causal ocean, he's holding the universes on his hoods. But you, you know, universes are big. Planets are big. I mean, you know, this building is heavy, and the, the building is part of Seattle, and Seattle's part of the United States. The United States is part of the Earth planet, holding the Earth planet on your head. But he's in such ecstasy, it feels like nothing, like a mustard seed. It's something, but next to nothing. Because he just likes to serve. So this shesha, we'll see some more as we go along, but this is a is nomenclature applies, it refers to that expansion of Balaram who holds the planets upon his hoods. So the source of Shesha, Balaram. And that is the same message as this Sva Mortim in the verse, which is his own subjective form, Govinda's subjective form, Govinda's expansion. So now let's go through this a little bit, Govinda's expansion, how does this work? Well, that comes a little bit later. From Krishna comes Balaram, and Balaram comes the next one, next one. We'll see, they have a nice chart. Um, and I highlighted especially this word, Adara Shaktim. Remember that one? From the verse? So, here's a little... Oh, you didn't put it in... Huh? Two slides later? Okay, okay. Okay, not two slides later. Okay, where is it? Huh? Huh? Two minutes. Just now coming. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So <laughs> I'll just say it while he's getting it ready. Um, in Brahma Samhita, the first text. Wow. There's reference to Adara Shakti where in Bhakti Siddhanta's purport to text one, that's our invocation verse, the Paribhasa Sutra, he indicates that the, that the spiritual world is manifested, the forms of the spiritual world, the trees, the rocks, the rivers, the mountains, you know, the people, the forms of Krishna. These are manifested by Balaram, his paraphernalia. There we go, look at that. Mystical, okay. We'll go back. No, that's not it. Not, that's not it either. Nice try. But you, you didn't get it. Oh. Oh. Anyway, we'll just keep going like it. Everything's normal. Everything's normal, Prabhu's. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's this, here's a quote from Bhakti Siddhanta's purport. Baladev. Baladev. Balaram. Just like. Jamuna was approaching Balaram or Baladev. He has two aspects, his spiritual and material service. And the spiritual side, um, he manifests things of the spiritual world. And the material side, he has this Adara Shakti capacity, that is, the infinite accommodating space for insentient gross things. Balaram accommodates whatever Krishna wants. If Krishna wants the spiritual world, boom. If Krishna wants the material cosmic manifestation, he facilitates that by his infinite accommodation potency. Adara Shakti. Balaram. He likes to serve. And in text 8, there's another reference to 
Adara Shakti. And I'm quoting from the purport of Bhakti Siddhanta. Nature, you know, material, material nature, embodying the accommodating principle, Adara, is Maya. So material nature. You know, like, not just the planet, but you know, the, you know, the big warehouse of material nature before you get planets and objects. Just, you know, material nature itself, mother nature. She has this capacity of accommodation. And I'll show you a slide. Maybe I'll show, yes, I will show you a slide that shows this because he, he has it sh set up. Um, well, I'll, I'll say it. It makes it real easy. As the womb of a mother provides two things, material nature provides the same two things. The womb of a mother provides the ingredients for the child to develop, and the womb of the mother provides the chamber where the child develops. That's easy. Similarly, material nature has these two aspects. It supplies the ingredients for the, the there he found it. Uh, it supplies the in ingredients um, for you know the universes and the forms within the universe and so forth, the material ingredients. And this other, it provides the accommodating chamber or adhara shakti, just like the womb of the mother, so material nature. And that feature of material nature is called the Dara Shakti. Hopefully I'll be able to show it in the next slide, as the little note says. And in this verse we see Adara Shaktim, which is the all-accommodating potency of Anantashesh. What is that? We'll see it detailed, but it's he wishes to serve. This is, is subjective nature. I want to serve in the spiritual world, sure, in the material world, sure. I just want to serve. The mood of service, we find this from Chaitanya Charitamrita, that the mood of service of all living entities is derived from Balaram. And Balaram's expansion is Anantashesh. He just wants to serve. So, whether it's this way or that way, he accommodates that service with his Adara Shaktim, his all-accommodating potency. That's what the verse is saying. Let's see what the next slide is. Yay, there it is. Okay. This is text 8, and this is the, the visual of what I just said. Um, Durga receives the Lord's glance. Remember that? Mahavishnu. The living entities are within the body of Mahavishnu. And two compassionate desires. One, those living entities that are now dormant, I wish compassionately that they can experience the fullness of the potential of their consciousness. So he wants to create a situation for that to happen. And he wishes that the shadow energy of his internal potency, Durga or Maya, she has some service to do. So. He, he glances, and the glance car carries the living entities. The impregnation act as his glance. The living entities and time energy are carried by the glance into the material nature. What does the material nature do? The following two things, just like a mother's womb does when receiving the seed from the father. Mother's womb does these two things. What's that? It supplies ingredients for the development of the body of the child. And it provides the accommodating chamber for the child's growth. So similarly, Durga or Maya or material nature has these two aspects. The ingredient aspect and the accommodating aspect. Very simple. 
And, you know, don't be surprised, there's Sanskrit terms that go with this. Nimitta maya and upadan maya, but I don't want to confuse you with terms, so. But it, it, it's, this, the, there's a science to all of this. I mean, imagine if, 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 you were, if you were a creator and you wanted to make a creation. This is a great way to do it. <laughs> we need ingredients, we need a chamber. Oh, very good, one, two. Here's, here's, here's the arrangement. And with material nature to create universes, so also mothers to create you know, the, that which fills up the universe. And you need a father. So, okay, we can make that arrangement too. We got some fathers and some mothers. So, the glance of Mahavishnu, that's the father. He's the seed-giving father of all living entities. Shambhu is assisting him. He's the halo of the glance. So he gets some credit too. He you know, has some role to play in the process of creation. Let's see. We Okay. Very good. You've got it in sequence. Thank you. I, I made some changes in what he had, so he had to like scramble and pull it together, so sorry for putting you on short notice. As you can see, this Adhara Shaktim has many different applications, but the meaning is always the same as found in this verse, the all accommodating potency. And it's by this Adhara Shaktim, or the all accommodating potency, that Shesha does what he does. He serves literally. Unlimited. That's what it means. His ananta means unlimited. He's unlimited in his service. Here's um, a verse from Chaitanya Charitamrita that describes a short list of some of those services. He serves Lord Krishna, assuming all the following forms. He doesn't go out to an umbrella store and buy an umbrella. He, he, he transforms himself into an umbrella. Slippers, bedding, pillow, garments, resting chair, residence, sacred thread, and throne. And more. That's Ananta Shesh in Goloka Vrindavan. He likes to serve and he does, he does it in all, wherever the Lord is. And where the Lord isn't. He's everywhere. So he's Ananta, <laughs> unlimited, and he, the serving capacity is through this Adara Shaktim, his all accommodating potency. He takes many forms for the service of Krishna, and thus he serves the Lord. And another little detail is in the dictionary, Sanskrit dictionary, this uh, Adara also indicates the basis or foundation. So. Ananta Shesh is the basis or foundation of the place of the Krishna's pastimes, the paraphernalia for Krishna's pastimes. Tell a little story. Um, Prabhupada, uh, when he came to America, he had his Bhagavatams, but he didn't have, you know, cartels in Radanga. So when he started, he used like, you know, little fabricated cartels. And like when he traveled with, um, what's the poet? Allen Ginsberg. Ginsberg. Famous or infamous, depending on how you look at it. He, Allen Ginsberg had bongo drums, so that was really popular amongst the countercultural hippies was bongo drums. Boom, 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 boom. So, that was the first time I had association with Prabhupada was at our university where Allen Ginsberg and Prabhupada were chanting together. And Prabhupada was playing cartels very nicely and Allen Ginsberg was playing bongos. So eventually some devotees went to India and Prabhupada wanted them to purchase Radanga. So he described and he drew a picture of a Madanga so they would get the right thing. And it's a really nice story. When <clears throat> the devotee came back from India, they came to Los Angeles and presented Prabhupada very happily with the Murdanga that 
somehow they managed to travel within it didn't crack because clay you know in an airplane can easily break so they gave it to Prabhupada set it right by his desk and immediately got from behind his desk and paid obeisance to the Radanga and took off his upper cloth he was always instructing by whatever he did and wrapped it around very carefully like a deity and said this is Balaram so we respect our, our Murdunga players over here especially should be listening we respect Murdunga as Balaram this is Prabhupada's personal example and so you know we, we keep the Murdunga wrapped we don't place it on the ground just like we don't place a book or a beads on the ground because they're sacred we treat Balaram as paraphernalia just as the all, all the paraphernalia on the altar although you know you can just go to a store and buy uh, you know some cups and some you know things that you, you the incense holder and the ghee lamp holder but after you begin using it in Krishna's service it has a special name it's called Tadiya it means paraphernalia for worship and it's worshipable the paraphernalia is worshipable because the the Adhara Shakti and potency of Balaram or Anantashesh is invested in it it becomes worshipable the storefront at 26 Second Avenue where the Hare Krishna movement began in, in America at one time um, because we had rented it and then somebody else had rented it it kind of the, the place got really used bad badly not uh, maintained and so our New York Temple President Ramabhadra got uh, a lease to rent the storefront we still have that lease on that storefront so he did some renovations they had to the, the floor was a rack so they pulled up the floor and I have a piece of the floor sitting in my office in New York and it's Tadiya it's you know it's worshipable you get the idea so Balaram by the by the touch of his mood of service he sanctifies things because they're to be used in service to Krishna he doesn't have any interest in anything other than service to Krishna and his interest is unlimited so now we're going to go through a little description like we did with Lord Shiva about the residence or multiple residences of Shesha one of them is at the bottom of the universe because Shesha is holding up the planets in the universe and also he's part of the whole process of universal destruction some fire comes from his mouth at the time of destruction destruction and the universe is engulfed in flames he's the service and uh, we'll see a, a next slide another uh, description of this that is if you remember from the Shakti Vesha avatars the, the categories of Shakti Vesha one was Bo Dharana Shakti Bo Dharana Shakti that's Ananta he holds up the earth Bo Dharana Shakti so that's where he resides at the bottom of the universe Patala Loka then he Ananta Shesha resides in each of the planets of or the abodes of Lord Vishnu causal ocean Garbhadak ocean milk ocean because the Lord is reclining on Ananta Shesha he exists also in Vaikuntha um, wherever the Lord has his throne and conveyances and his all of his paraphernalia and his Brahmin's thread and his everything that's manifestation of Ananta and Mataji will be very happy to hear this he's also in Ayodhya <laughs> Ram Ram here's the quote um, in the Skanda Purana 
This is quoting from a purport of Chaitanya Charitamrita, which I'm sure she'll note. In the Skanda Purana, in the Ayodhya Mahatma Ch Mahatmya chapter, the demigod Indra, you know, after uh, after Ravana is killed and so forth and so on, and Indra is approaching them, and Indra um, requested Shesha, who was standing before him as Lakshmana, said, Please return to your eternal abode, Vishnu Loka, where your expansion Shesha, with his serpentine hoods, is also present. Um, and there's another reference I'll show in, in coming up. And what happened? Well, he's also in Goloka. Goloka just disappeared. Oh, there's Goloka at the bottom. So here's this other reference, again from the same purport, Adi Lila chapter 5. Ananta Shesha is a devotee incarnation of Godhead. He knows nothing but service to Lord Krishna, from the purport. Sankarshana, another term. Sankarshana of the quadruple form. Quadruple form. So, well, um, you remember the abode of Goloka, the, the lotus flower with Radha and Krishna's abode in the middle, and the petals are the abodes of the gopis, and outside is that Sweta Dreep region. And in that Sweta Dreep region, it's four sided Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradumna, and Aniruddha. So this is speaking of those four Sankarshan of the quadruple form descends with Lord Ram as Lakshmana. When Lord Ram disappears, Shesha, again, separates himself from the personality of Lakshmana. Shesha returns to his own abode in the Patala region, and Lakshmana returns to his abode in Vaikuntha, or Ayodhya. Anyway, it's a detail of Shesha, likes to assist Ram. So when Ram appears, he enters into the body of Lakshmana, assists Lakshmana in serving Ram, and when the Leela is over, he goes back to Patala. Doesn't give the technology. It's just he likes to serve. Here's that Shakya Avatar slide. So, Ananta Shesh is a Shakya Avatar. And specifically when he's holding the hoods, the comment is made that he is commonly known as Ananta Dev, or sometimes Sankarsana. Now, this is a little drawing of Rupa Goswami. Rupa Goswami speaks about Ananta also and his Lago Bhagavatamrita. I mentioned this a couple of times, I'll repeat. Lago Bhagavatamrita is a description of the incarnations, the avatars. That's all it does. The, they indicate the, the position of Govinda or Krishna as the source of all avatars. He covers in detail in four different ways with the avatars of Vishnu or avatars of, of, of Krishna. In that Lago Bhagavatamrita, he has the following description of Shesha, which goes like this. The Sankarsana of the second group of quadruple forms, that means in, there's the four in Goloka, and then there's the expansion in Vaikuntha realm. That's the second so where Narayana resides, there's also Sankarshan, Pradumna, Aniruddha, and Vasudev in Vaikuntha realm. So from that second Karsha, Sankarshana, um, he appears as Ram, taking with him Shesha, who bears the global spheres. There are two features of Shesha. One is the bearer of the globes, 
he holds the planets on his heads. And the other is the bedstead servitor. So th those are two very different services. So two, two different categories or manifestations of Shesha. The Shesha who bears the globes is a potent incarnation of Sankarshan. And therefore he is sometimes also called Sankarshana. The bedstead feature of Shesha always presents himself as an eternal servitor of the Lord. I'm giving these as just scriptural references that help us fill in the picture of Shesha and how he does what he does in service to the Supreme. Um, as, as far as the destruction of the universes, Shesha plays a role, as mentioned, he's at the bottom of the universe. And I'll, I'll say it and then I'll read it. He, um, he wants to serve the Lord. And he knows what the Lord's desire is. We discussed it f six times already. He wants the creation to come about so the living entities can restore their fullness of consciousness. That's what the Lord wants, compassionately. But when Ananta sees these rascal <laughs> people, living entities, they don't do that. They go and run around and do crazy things. So he becomes angry. But he controls his anger because he's trying to do the service of holding the universes and holding the planets. But when it's time, then he lets his anger out. And the flames come from his mouth, from his hoods. And, the, and the, all, the, all the planets in the universe are engulfed in fire. So he plays a role. That's what this quote says. Fifth Canto Bhagavatam, chapter 25. Lord Sankarsana is the ocean of unlimited spiritual qualities and thus he is known as Ananta Deva. He is non-different from the Supreme Personality of Godhead for the welfare of all living entities within this material world. He resides in his abode Restraining his anger. Transcendental anger. Not our kind. And the purport of that verse says, His main mission is to dissolve the material creation, but he checks his anger and intolerance you know, for his service. These the activities of the conditioned souls anger Ananta Dave, and he desires to destroy the entire material world. Yet, because he is the Supreme Personality of God, he is kind towards us and checks his anger and intolerance. Only at a certain time does he express his anger and destroy the material world. Well, that's a service too. And here's the description of how he does it. At the time of devastation, when Lord Ananta desires to destroy the entire creation, he becomes slightly angry. Then, from between his two eyebrows appears three-eyed Rudra, carrying a trident. This Rudra, who is known as Sankarsana, is the embodiment of the eleven Rudras, or incarnations of Lord Shiva. He appears in order to devastate the entire creation. If you remember that Mahakalapur, that's where the Rudras were sent, in this lower region. So... This descript one description is they're engaged in penance, another is Anantashesh manifests them. They, they, they assist them. They're happy to assist them. They like to destroy things. So Anantashesh breathes flames and they dance and make the flames go. They make a good team. And here's a painting of that devastation the flames coming from the mouths of Ananta. Okay, that's this section. And we're ready for the final verse for this evening. Are you ready?
previous verse before the translation I want to because we're seeing it on the screen emphasize the last part of the third line yasya kala vishesha yasya kala vishesha um, this is whose um, plenary portion or expansion so this the whose is it's a possessive pronoun it's Govinda's personal uh, plenary portion or expansion Kala what is this I'm going to spend some time in Prabhupada's language Kala the portion of a plenary portion what does that mean? So we'll, we'll spend some time. And it's in reference to this kal Kala terminology. So Brahma, there we go, and other lords of the mundane worlds appearing from the pores of hair of Mahavishnu remain alive as long as the duration of one exhalation of the latter, Mahavishnu. I adore the primeval Lord, Govinda, of whose subjective personality, Mahavishnu, is the portion of portion. So, yasya kala vishesha, whose portion of a plenary portion. So what does that mean? Um, from the Bhagavatam, we have the final, the following understanding. The origin of the material creation is Mahavishnu, who lies in the causal ocean. When he's, while he sleeps, not like we sleep, while he sleeps in that ocean, millions of universes are generated as he exhales. And they are all annihilated when he inhales. This Mahavishnu is a plenary portion of a portion of Vishnu, Govinda, yes, ya kala vishesha. So now here's Prabhupada's explanation of that. The word kala refers to a plenary portion of a plenary portion. What does that mean? From Krishna or Govinda comes Balaram. That's his first expansion. From Balaram comes Sankarsana. From Karsana, Narayana, Vaikuntha. From Narayana, the second Sankarsana. From the second Sankarsana, Mahavishnu. From Mahavishnu, Garbhadakshay Vishnu. From Garbhadakshay Vishnu, Shiradakshay Vishnu. We're going to show this in pictures, by the way, because it's not just words. Shiradakshay Vishnu controls every universe. This gives an idea of the meaning, ananta, unlimited. What is to be said of the unlimited potency and existence of the Lord? So here's the visual of the verbal. There's Krishna, and Krishna expands as Balaram, Prabhupada says over and over, the only difference between the two is the color. They're actually the same person, only Balaram is of white like snow and Krishna is black like a monsoon cloud. Balaram expands as Sankarsana. 
That's Sankarshana who uh, Lord Shiva worships with his prayers. Sankarshana expands as Narayana of Vaikuntha. Narayana expands as the second Sankarshana. And that second Sankarshana expands as Mahavishnu who creates the universes. And then Mahavishnu expands to enter within each universe. And Garbhadakshya Vishnu expands to enter entering within every atom. There's a nice graphic depiction of all of that. So Govinda or Krishna is the original. Here's another. Just the names, Krishna, Balaram. Then we get a little more detailed from uh, the, the manifestation of the first Chaturvyuha, Sankarsana and Vasudev, Pradumna and Aniruddha. Now that, that's in, this is all Goloka. And from that, Sankarsana expands Narayana of Vaikuntha, the Haridam region. Second Sankarshan, Mahavishnu, Garbhadakshya Vishnu, Shiradakshya Vishnu. He controls every universe and every atom within the universe. Micro and macro at the same time. The bigger than the biggest and smaller than the s smallest. You can't get any smaller than an atom. You know, the, the, the <laughs> Prabhupada has translated a certain word as an atom. But the, the, the Sanskrit meaning is the smallest divisible particle of matter. So, as far as modern science, they call it an atom, so he calls it an atom. But the smallest divisible particle not, cannot be further divided. Shiradakshya Vishnu is smaller. At least he's inside. He's within every atom. At the same time, he's so big that from the pores of his skin, universes come. And he's so, the, 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 the duration of his life is so great, or his existence, just his breath. I mean, imagine. <sighs> and universes come and universes go out of being. Then he holds his breath for a bit. Then he breathes again. I mean, how big is Mahavishnu? And how small is Shirdakshay Vishnu? And the, anyway, and bigger than the biggest and smaller than the smallest at the same time. He doesn't like vacillate back and forth or oscillate. He's, he's the greatest. So this word Kala Specific, according to um, Bhakti Siddhanta, it's referring to Shira Dakshay Vishnu. So it's a, a portion of a plenary portion. Balaram is the plenary portion, and all the others are a portion of him. And the Lord is un thus an Ananta, or unlimited. Okay. So I'm going to narrate, I'll try to go quickly. This pastime of Lord Brahma, as you see, riding on his swan carrier, passing over where the Vrindavan, where the cowherd boys are having lunch. Brahma came to see Krishna and observe his pastimes. And he had just seen, before this particular lunch, he had just seen Krishna kill a gas or a demon. And he was wondering, wow. His power, his potency seems to be unlimited. I wonder what the limit, he was curious, what's the limit of his potency? So he got into that mood and so he decided he would see what Krishna would do with his mystic potency when over on the right hand side you see there's Lord Brahma when they're having their lunch over there on the left hand side, he's taking all the, the calves and taking the calves away and putting them into a cave. And then when the boys say, oh, the calves are gone, Krishna says, don't worry, I'll find the calves, you can finish your lunch. So Krishna goes away to look for the calves and look over there on the left, there's Balaram, excuse me, there's Lord Brahma. 
stealing the cowherd boys. So he puts the cowherd boys and the calves in a cave. And he goes back to see what's Krishna going to do now. And when he went back to see what Krishna is going to do now, he saw the cows and all the calves and all the cowherd boys. I just put them in the cave. What happened? So he goes back to the cave, and they're in the cave. What happened? What's going on? So then he went back to where they were having lunch, and instead of the scene of their sitting there having lunch, and then all of a sudden there's not the boys anymore. It's all forms of Narayana for each one of the boys and each one of the calves. And then all of a sudden, all those forms of Narayana just disappear. And there's just little Gopal standing there looking at him. And so, as we see, he pays his obeisances before Krishna. And he offers prayers to Krishna. Very beautiful, beautiful prayers. Beautiful prayers. Uh, and in the course of those beautiful prayers we discussed, he, Brahma, says, you're not just this little boy. You're Narayana. Remember our discussing this. And Krishna says to Brahma, please consider, what are you saying? You're the first living being born in the universe and so many... Uh, Manvantars later, here I am, I, this little boy Krishna, you're saying I'm your father. What are you talking? Please consider. So then he gives his reasons. No, it's true. I'll prove it. You're Narayan. And he gives three different explanations of why you're Narayan. So they're the same. This Narayana and Krishna. Brahma understands very clearly. And some of our artists have some very nice depictions of Brahma offering his prayers. He is the same as this supreme person from whom so many universes are coming. He is the source of that Mahavishnu. Okay. And that's it. We've just covered 46. 47 and 48. So let's see if there's any discussion. All the way. You have a question? No, over here. And then in the back, next. Guru yeah. Maharaj, yeah. I have a question from a class you gave almost 10 years ago. A class from 10 years ago? Yeah, in a Microsoft you organized a program with Sada Buddha Das's uh, Mechanist of Universe. And there you give a explanation on this uh, Shiro Dakshai Vishnu and Garb uh, the Mahavishnu and yeah. all lineage. I didn't understand there and I didn't ask that time, but it's always in my mind. You made a statement there saying the bags of mustard seeds, that many universes come out, but there was a discussion about infinite or limited number of universes yeah. are there. And there was an argument with one Microsoft person there. Uh, how many universes come out? Is it number is infinite or limited in a sense? And well, the, 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 the way that Prabhupada says it is finite but so many you cannot count. Now I suppose if you take a bag, literally, take a bag of mustard seeds, you can count how many mustard seeds there are in a bag, so it's finite. But it's so many u universes that they're, they're spoken of as infinite. But you know, it's just same as the living entities. How many living entities are there? It's infinite, but it's, it's finite number, but so many, too many to count, like that. Okay? Thank you. Okay. In the back. So sometimes in your lectures you refer to as expansions, and in the case of Sankarshan, you had used the term incarnation. So are these two interchangeable? 
or in this case of Sankarsha, it is a specific incarnation? Um, they're, they're, they're not exactly interchangeable. One, one term means something and another term means another something. So they're not exactly interchangeable. Incarnation specifically means to sense in this world from the spiritual world into this world. That's incarnation or avatar. And expansion may or may not descend this world. Yes. Guru Maharaj, you were explaining um, how heavy is the earth um, that Lord Chung Ananta Dev is holding, and you brought up the example of a mustard seed. So you know it's like something, but uh, you know next to nothing for him. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> that uh, reminded me of the term you use sometimes, labor of love. Yeah. Um, so would you kindly explain that when one is at that um, uh, you know, is offering a labor of love uh, to Krishna, to one spiritual master, is it that there is n no experience even of any inconvenience or... Of course. Look, you're a mother. Are you inconvenienced? Ask me. <laughs> Man, you're inconvenienced. <laughs> but for you, it's a labor of love. It's easy to understand, isn't it? Next question. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, I'm trying to understand at what stage glancing takes place and at what stage breathing takes place of Mahavishnu. Glancing and breathing? Yeah, like, is it... <laughs> <laughs> I get your question. Someone recently asked that question from China, actually. Um, so let's, let's go like this. One more time. This is cosmic annihilation time. He's inhaled. So when he inhales, the living entities come within his body and they're in this susupti state, deep sleep, anesthetized. They're still conscious souls but not manifesting it. It's dormant consciousness. And the material energy is gone back to its undifferentiated state because he withdraws the time energy. It's, that's the plug. It's how it starts it, it's how it stops it. Just withdraws the time energy, or Ramad does it. So time energy is withdrawn, the mode stopped, karma stops, the differentiated matter goes into an undifferentiated state. Everything's in a resting position. So, then the contemplation, living entities, and the glance. <coughs> So, the glance agitates this pradhan, this un undifferentiated matter, <clears throat> and elements start to differentiate out, and the modes of nature start to become active. So, there's, but it's, there's no universes yet, there's no fo bodies yet, it's just living entities, matter, time, modes of nature, and then, chronologically, <sighs> because that's the universes. They're, they're within the, the pores of his, because it's, it's mystical, it's not like you know our breathing, it's, or our sleeping. It's just he exhales, and these golden seeds, they're not universes yet, they're seeds of universes, they come streaming from his body, and they contact this matter, Mahatattva, and it's described the, the elements cling, or his word is conglomerate, around the, those golden seeds. And so the seeds start to expand. 
But, you know, there's some things that happen next. The things that happen next are, there are also controlling deities of the elements, and not, they're not able to cooperate. You know what, how it's like that sometimes, a bunch of people get together, they don't know how to cooperate. So, they then offer prayers to Mahavishnu, from whom they've come, because there's no universes yet. These are prototype. There's no universe yet to be the controllers of. They pray to him, please give us the energy and the intelligence, two things, to put, put the universe together. So he agrees and he expands and pr pr provides that arrangement for them. That's the Kriya Shakti. Anyway, it's like detail. So those, that's the glance and the breathing part. Then, so the, the glance is the impregnation and then the, the withdrawal, it, it doesn't have to glance again, he just desires that the creation becomes dormant again. So Rama withdraws the time energy and he inhales. And then, so the, it's, it's, it's cyclical. The, the living entities are again within the body of Mahavishnu in this dormant conscious state and the elements are again in their resting state. And then there's resting period for equal night, equal duration. So the follow-up question is, um, it doesn't mean, um, can we say that he's always, his eyes are always open? Like, because every time he breathes, he's glancing. Every time he breathes, he does what? Glance, glances the material nature. Well, his glancing is not like yours and mine. <laughs> so he can glance with his eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> because we also hear that he's in yoga nidra, so like he's sleeping. Yeah, but he's not sleeping like we're sleeping. <laughs> With his eyes closed or open, it's it's it, the 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 idea that the, the the language is nidra. Nidra means sleep. So we do nidra and he does nidra, and they're not the same. It for him, it's enjoying his eternal pastimes within. Mm -hmm. So he's not like you know dreaming that he's going to enjoy with Rama Devi. He's enjoying with Rama Devi. He, he, there's no need for sleep. It's just you know. His sleep is his enjoying within. Our sleep is <laughs> <laughs> different. Got it? Yeah. One more question I have, Maharaj. You were mentioning that devotees... It does spe specifically speak that his eyes are not closed, but they're like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, slightly open. But it's, it's, it, 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 as a sleeping is not like our sleeping, his glancing is not like our glancing. You, you mentioned that devotees worship the Supreme Lord, but they respect all the living entities according to their disposition. Yes. Disposition relative to the Supreme Lord or yes. relative to oneself? Related to the Supreme okay. Lord. Because that's who we are. We're, we're a part of Him. Our, 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 our identity is not separate from Him. One who thinks that self-realization is, is separate from God-realization is in la-la land. They're in Maya. Okay? Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Actually, my question was also in line with uh, Shamla Mataji's question. Did it get answered? One thing, uh, is Mahavishnu's breath is for, one breath is for uh, billions of years because we have 14 Manus and one universe. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's just one day of Brahma, it's like for a whole lifetime of Brahma. Okay. Okay? okay. But we're going to hear about Brahma next. Okay. Tomorrow morning. 
Okay, Maharaj. And one more thing, uh, I have a question. Um, in when when you explain the expansions from Lord Krishna to Shirodaksha Vishnu, uh, San Krishna, you said the Lord Shiva worship uh, San Krishna. Yes, he does. And then there is second San Krishna, and uh, one of your slides said that Rudras are also called San Krishna. So what is the difference in that? It's just nomenclature. It depends on function. You know, sometimes it's not called, sometimes it's called, according to function. Just like you. Some say, some say mom, some say Mrs. So-and-so, and some say, you know, your husband some, made something else. You're one, so, one person may have different nomenclature depending upon function. That's all. Don't get confused, please. <laughs> Understand it in that context that I just gave. So it is not the one thing. It's not one. Uh, yes. It, well, it, you know, the the, na the nomenclature is is relatively common and standard, but there's variations because of function and circumstance and relationship. You follow? No, you don't follow. That's why you're okay. No. So why Rudras are called as Sankarshna? Are they Sankarshna? But it's when, they when, they're, when they're assisting him in that function. Okay. When they're assisting Sankarshan in the function of destroying the universe, as they're assisting him, they may be also, they may be also called Sankarsha. Okay. They may be. But normally not. Normally it's, you know, Rudra because, you know, they're just, they're doing the Rudra program. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. No? Really? Okay. <laughs> Here we go, the boys in the front. Microphone. You got the microphone? Microphone up front. Oh, you had something too? Yeah. Hare Krishna Prabhu. How do I understand the word expansion or Ramsa? What does it really mean? Does it mean What that does it really mean? Yeah, so what do you I mean don't, I don't, I, It's a secret, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, it, it, it's, the metaphor is a candle lighting another candle. The, so the, the implication of the candle lighting another candle is the original candle is not reduced. The power of the original candle is transferred to the second candle. So that's the metaphor. Like that, so also expansion is one minus one is one. It's a, a, a replica without reducing the original. It's not even like you know, a fax copy. Because fax copy is a copy, it's not the original. These are as good as. Um, in that case, when we say that uh, Shankarshana, Narayana, Ranthasesha, everything is a uh, expansion of Krishna, do they do we mean that they also possess all the qualities of the Krishna, or is it like um, is they, there they, they have they, they have the potencies of. However, there is a distinction in terms of the unique four qualities that Govinda has or Krishna has that Narayana doesn't have. But the potencies of both are the same. Thank you. Thank you. That answers okay. the question. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Krishna Guruji. Help me to understand uh, these aspects of Krishna, which are the descended divinities in the human form. When he descends in the human form? Yeah, I am, for me, I am believing this, that there are some on the planet now, and I just want to understand it. I don't know it. Okay. Yeah. Take the microphone from him. <laughs> um, we, we discussed this yesterday evening, and I said, um, this is how Prabhupada has trained us. And that is, we accept something on the basis of Guru Sadhu Shastra. If there's not reference from Shastra or scripture about something, whatever that something might be, 
including, you know, is this person an incarnation or not a per this person not an incarnation? Um, we accept on the authority of scripture or not. So, with reference to scripture, then yes. And without reference to scripture, then not. That's very simple. And, you know, the next, for your, for, for, according to scripture, the next time there will be an incarnation of the Supreme Lord is at the end of Kali Yuga. That's another f uh, about 430,000 years from now. Yes. Who's got the microphone? Go ahead. Um, so, why, why do, why do you usually chant like first verse 1 and then immediately to verse 29? Because I'm a strange person. <laughs> No, that's not the reason. There's some logic behind it. Because last Thanksgiving, I discussed from verse 1 through verse 28, and we stopped at the Govinda prayers and went to the final verses. You know, what, 57 through 62. Because I wanted this time to just cover the Govinda prayers. However, the Govinda prayers are expanding on the first one. So this time I did the first one and then continued where we left off last time. That's why. And, and also like... There is logic to it. And, and only starting on verse 29, um, the verses end with Govinda, Madhi, Purusham, Tamahamadhyam. Except the very last verse, 56, doesn't end like that. But it's part of the prayers of Govinda, of, of Brahma to Govinda. So I included that one too, 56. Thank you. You're welcome. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So my question is, um, what does each Vishnu do? What does Vishnu do? Yeah, so like He what, maintains. So what does Maha Vishnu do? Like what specific? He creates, the, he, he, exp he manifests the universes and maintains them. Through his expansion, Shira Dakshi Vishnu. Okay. You have something? No. Online? No? Okay, over here. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Um, I'm just curious, uh, like global warming, all these disasters, it, is it just um, Siva doing his work? Um, if it's he just like performing his duties, then shall we do anything about um, these disasters? Yes, we should do something. Um, you want to know what? Yeah, I, I want to know what um, to do? You want to know what to do? Like, since is, um, it's a duty of Siva, so... We don't want to interfere with his duty. Yeah. That's your point? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sure. <laughs> but you have your duty, too. <laughs> and he can certainly change his mood based upon being inspired by seeing us do our duty of becoming pure devotees. When he sees that, he becomes, his mood changes. Instead of becoming angry, he becomes happy. And then his duty can be transformed. Yeah. That's the power of bhakti. He's a, he's a devotee too. And he's just like, you know, why are you people doing nonsense? Again, you invoking Hari Vilas's favorite vocabulary word. <laughs> Why are you people doing nonsense? So, um, but if we do Krishna conscious or, you know, activities that are in harmony with the will of the Supreme, oh, that's very nice. He, he, one of his names 
is ashutosh, which means easily angered at easily pleased. Mm -hmm. So his anger can change to pleasure. And that's part of our service. But we know the business is not just changing his anger. Our business is pleasing Krishna. Mm -hmm. And when he sees Krishna is pleased, he becomes happy, pacified. I have another question. Okay. So that was a good question. Uh, are we also the manifestation of Krishna? Yes. A very but tiny. Because in Krishna is unlimited. But we're like him in quality, but very different in quantity. And because of that qu quantitative difference, our nature is to serve him. He's very great and we're very tiny. And it's our nature to want to serve him. It's, it's why we exist. So like you know, the other question, why creation? Why living entities? And living entities are there as expansions for Krishna, of Krishna, for increasing Krishna's pleasure, Krishna's happiness. His pleasure and happiness are unlimited. But they're also ever increasing and living entities are like this variety is the mother of enjoyment message. So living entities, look around the room, so for, you know, like you commented when you found out that we have uh, devotees in your hometown. Oh, I didn't know that the Hare Krishna movement was all over the place. There's, there's, there's bhakti in the hearts of living entities everywhere. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. Everywhere, everywhere. It's amazing. So, when those living entities render service to Krishna, Krishna is very happy. We want to make Krishna happy. Making Krishna happy makes us happy. That's our happiness. It's love. Mm -hmm. The happiness of love. And you're becoming happy is making us happy. Because we know Krishna is becoming happy. Okay? Yes. Oh. Go ahead. Take to her. Raise your hand. Go ahead, Balram. Oh, I had a couple of questions. One uh, quick one. When the universes uh, come out and they again go back, so is there, is there any mention that all the universes from Mahavishnu can go, come out and then all go back together at the same time? So there is. It's not exactly. The universes don't go back, the living entities come back. Right. The, the, okay. the, the, what comes from his body is not the universe, it's the seeds. Yeah, oh, yeah. And then the seeds are sent forth to the material elements. The material elements cling to the seeds. When it's time for annihilation, the elements go back to their undifferentiated state. The seeds return, the seeds return at his inhalation of living entities into his body. So does that happen all for all the universes at yeah. the same time? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. As they go, they come. Next question. Uh, next question is, as we see this elaborate, I mean elaborate is a small word to say, all this arrangement that is made to create the material creation, just we can't even... Just for us, huh? Yeah, so I was just thinking, I mean it's completely incomprehensible. Yes. Absolutely. It, we can't replicate it. Yeah. Even the human body itself is incomprehensible, so what about hearing all of these things? It's, so, as a lesson for us as we try to understand this, what, what can we understand in terms of the nature of the Supreme Lord? He's very compassionate. Us, and the lesson for us? That's, he's very compassionate. And, and we're very selfish and foolish. And, you know, it'd be, it's good to recognize that, that the error of our ways and correct from the error side to the you know, the, in harmony with this loving person side. That's that was that's the take home. And we're being given, you know, not only the facility, we're being given encouragement and resources and please take it, please take it. And we're going well. 
Let me think about it. <laughs> yes. One of the things I realized after listening to the Brahma Samhita classes is that the Big Bang theory um, completely aligns with the process of creation mm. that we have described in Brahma Samhita. Mm. For example, the universe is expanding and there is a cooling stage and things sure, like that. Is sure, that sure. is that true? Understand? Yes, yes, yes. In the back, all the way. The cause of the expanding and the contracting have a different, you know, the reason why, but yeah, the phenomena is similar. Yes? Hare Krishna, Mara. Uh, what is the difference between disaster, uh, Lord Shiva's service is disaster of university and Lord Mahavishnu's inhalation and exhalation? He's, he inhales the all universes. That means that itself is disaster of a universe. Well, but but that's just, be before he inhales, the, 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 the place is destroyed. There's fire, and then the fire expands. The fire comes from Ananta, and Tandava Nitra, the fire of the, the dance of devastation, comes from Lord Shiva, and it just expands and expands and expands and expands and winds, and whoo, And then everything is withdrawn. It's part of the devastation process. It's like Teamwork. You know, at Microsoft and <coughs> Teams, yes. So, uh, each uh, universe has a different, one single uh, Lord Shiva who has this different expansions? Correct. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's what I wanted. And are they all like f um, uh, many faced, like, like Lord Brahma, like one has four heads, one has hundred heads? I don't know. I never heard any description about how many. Hare Krishna Maharaj, um, you described how Lord Balaram is um, serving in every single way possible. To the max. And in Vrindavan, I remember you mentioned that he even expands in all the different rasas. Yes, he does. And he's non different from Krishna. And here is Srimati Radharani, always thinking to serve Krishna, always serving, non different from Krishna. And I was trying to understand what is it about Srimati Radharani that makes her the most intimate. Because it seems like both are very, very similar. Uh, but the mood, I'm guessing, is different. Well, the rasa is different. He, wi he Balaram expands as Ananga Manjri to assist Radha in her loving relationship with Krishna. Because that's most pleasing to Krishna. He just wants to serve Krishna. But Radharani is his Sladini potency. Balaram isn't. He's his expansion. It's a difference, you know, the mood of service is similar, but the, the tattva is different. Shakti tattva is not the same as Vishnu tattva. It's different. Yes. Um, <coughs> Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, I want, um, want to know if there is any significance that uh, Anantashesh uh, body is uh, of a serpent. I'm trying to reconcile with the fact that uh, I've heard a story that uh, once uh, there was a serpent and Bhakti Siddhant Maharaj asked the serpent to be killed because he's in a body which is full of envy. And uh, so why, uh, uh, with that understanding, then why Lord Anantashesh is in the serpent form? Is there any significance there? Is there any significance? That's the punchline. Um, no. Yeah, just trying no to reconcile, reconcile these two, uh, like that story of the serpent I, being. Okay. Well, yeah. it, 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 it's something like you know that which is like the, like the banyan tree. This reflected in the lake, that which is topmost becomes bottommost in the reflection. What is what Krishna does in Goloka is abominable in the material world, in the parakya relationship. It's abominable, but what Krishna does is glorious because it's not exactly it's 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 wholesome and pure. So, 
the, the Ananta Shesh is just a, a form that he is he manifests for service. It's convenient, you know. Then so, but whether it's um, a, a, a snake or a scorpion, you know, the it, the, the nature of without provocation causing pain and even causing death for others. That, I remember Prabhupada saying that when he, when he heard that Bhakti Siddhanta had requested like that, he was shocked. Until then relieved later when he found the scriptural reference that, that says, Asada was very relieved. Like, you know, when Krishna kills Kamsa or kills the demons. It's that kind of you know, the, and the demigods celebrate. When a wicked-minded person is relieved from, you know, that, that wicked-mindedness, their sin and their, the reactions of their sins are relieved, and the disturbance that's causing for others is relieved. It's celebration. So, there, the... I don't, know, I don't know if I've satisfied your question. Yes, but Maharaj, I think yeah, that the body, of, even though the body of serpent in the spiritual world will not be full of, will not yeah. be similar to the body that yes, the serpent thank has. You. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Maharaj. Yeah. Last question. We're at 9.30. Maharaj, hopefully a quick one, Maharaj. Um, so you mentioned that Krishna never leaves uh, Vrindavan in the Golok Dham. Uh, my question is that then does is it correct to understand that the mood of separation um, in the gopis also does not exist no. in the Golok Dham? Oh no. There, there's, there's the bhava that Krishna is leaving or going to leave. There's not a pastime of leaving but there's the bhava. So Maharaj, I've heard this pastime, maybe I'm not able to share it correctly, but like uh, I've heard that the gopis and Srimati Radharani, they prepare, uh, every day they prepare garlands for Krishna in the hope that he will come back. And then by evening, when he doesn't come back, then they become very disappointed and uh, they break the garlands and throw them away and then next day again they the same process repeat so if there's only the as you said um, the sense of separation does this pastime uh, also occur or does not occur or maybe i'm going too deep into technical details in which case it's not even deep or technical details it's just speculation <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Krishna. Uh, actually, we'll take a few moments and, and uh, honor Jai Sachinadan Prabhu today here. It's his birthday. And, uh, and I would like to say a few words about him, actually. Uh, you know, he's a temple president of Portland. And uh, 10, 11 years ago, when we went to Portland, there was nothing. There was a little warehouse we rented, Hari Prabhu, myself, we had gone. And uh, rent was 1500 or 1800 And we paid first month or two rent from here. I sent the money for light bill and all. And then Jai Sachinandan Prabhu and Mataji, Bhakti Rasa, and little Arpana back then was so young. They've been a tremendous strength and the pillar of, uh, you know, they, they were like Anand Sesha, what we're learning today. They held up the temple. Once upon a time in 2008, I kind of thought, and even Hari Vlas Prabhu discussed, that temple might shut down or, or, you know, if he moves out, he was asking, he asked me if he should move to Seattle and things like that. But something or other kept him there, going there. And today, in 2014, they bought a beautiful building and uh, it opened on a Balram Astami, again, Seshanag, you know, the Lord Sesha. So, Jai Seshanandan Prabhu should be given a big kudos, personal thank you from everybody, from the amount of service he has done for Portland community. It's very extraordinary what he has done. And, and I see miracle in my life that I consider that uh, happening of temple there is one of the miracle. And thank you very much with a lot of gratitude. He's also done a lot of service to our temple. When we were building this temple, 
I was always scrambling for the funds. And then, you know, he said, I'll send you the check. And I couldn't believe it. So he's a big hearted man, he's a wonderful devotee, he's a full time physician, working so many hours, but he he has created a beautiful devotional life all around him actually and then close to his family and then you know of course without Mataji's support and his mother's support and the father who left the world and uh, Arpna I mean they are just tremendous I request you if you do not know about them get to know them you will appreciate it so Prabhu bring the cake and uh, and the garland oh Venkat Prabhu's birthday also Hari Ball Venkat Prabhu has just moved across the temple and uh, we hope he continues to serve. And there is another birthday, Krishna Chaitanya's birthday today? Yes, is he here? Yes. Oh, okay. So Prabhu, please come in front, get blessings from Maharaj and Nishla Prabhupada. Venkat, please.